All right. Welcome to Book by Book. We are in 2 Samuel 9 through 12 this week, and we are going to be uh, watching the, the peak of David, and then we will start seeing the fall of David um, as we look at his kindness to uh, Jonathan's son. Um, and his, you know, we've been seeing him have defeat and our victory after victory in all these different areas. Um, and he's getting comfortable uh, in his role as a king. Um, but that could also be leading to his eventual downfall uh, as he um, sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof. And from there, we see him covering up his actions, trying to cover up his actions leading to somebody dying and it's just all it's tragic and from here on out in the life of david we really just see a lot of tragedy that comes back to this um this sinful season in his life but the main difference that we'll see between uh david and saul is that when david is confronted with his sin he repents and he names the 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 degree of his sin like Saul when Samuel confronted him Saul was like oh please forgive me but I just help me out still I still need you whereas David is like I have sinned against the Lord and that is a, a major change and difference between uh between Samuel and David Samuel is always or not Samuel Saul and David Saul was all about image management and trying to hold on to influence with the people but David really did recognize his uh, transgression against God. And so that is uh, part of what we will be walking through uh, in these chapters tonight. Um, and every time I read through these, I am so grateful for the grace of God that is, uh, that even is, is even on display in this event, because there is more that God could have done. But there is still, but God is gracious um, to his servant David here. So let's uh, jump in. Chapter 9, verse 1. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to keep the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Now we first meet Mephibosheth uh, earlier in second. Samuel, and we are introduced to the fact that uh, when he was lame because uh, when Saul's family was killed, they were evacuating and trying to protect him, and they uh, dropped him as a young child and damaged his legs somehow. So, you know, that like 
uh, it is, it was a childhood injury that made it so he could not work uh, for himself and to not be able to work for yourself, like to tend fields and flocks and that kind of stuff. That was a major disadvantage um, in the, in the ancient world, because that's really the only way you had to produce wealth and provide for your family. And so he is in this region, uh, Lo Debar, which is on the east side of the Jordan, uh, kind of uh, in exile, because Saul's family is in this, you know, uncomfortable place where David is king. And, you know, can they really trust that David will watch out for them? And so as the last son of Jonathan, uh, and so the grandson of Saul, he is, uh, yeah, his, his state is precarious with, you know, politically. And so David is asking, is there anyone here to, anyone remaining in Saul's family that I can show kindness to? Because uh, Jonathan asked David to swear an oath to preserve his family. And this was something that, uh, you know, in the changing of a dynasty, the the new king would more more often than not wipe out the sons and the family of the old king to eliminate any potential claims to the throne but jonathan knew that david was going to be king and so they made this oath and we read about that in first samuel before jonathan died they made this oath to say like i will watch out for your family and so now david is established and as the king and he is wanting to fulfill his oath to jonathan um, and so they reach out to Ziba, who uh, is steward over, uh, over the possessions that Mephibosheth has as a steward over Saul's, whatever it is they were able to preserve of Saul's estate. Because as coming into the being the king, David took all that over too, because he's king now. And so he took Saul's uh, estate uh, and it is now part of the king's property. And so uh, so he is um, wanting to fulfill the oath. That's what it comes down to. He's fulfilling an oath. And so when Mephibosheth is summoned, as we read through here, like he's afraid. There's a, there's a, a, a great uh, trepidation in Mephibosheth coming to the king because, you know, the king summons you as a descendant of his enemy, like you're probably thinking, I'm going to get killed here. The king's going to execute me. Um, and so that's why he's bowing so low. That's why he's calling himself just a dead dog. Like he's, he's debasing himself before the king. Um, and, and David is trying to elevate him to say, no, you are the son of my best friend. And so I want to, I want to take care of, of you. And so last week when David captured Jerusalem, uh, he said uh, as one of the curses against the Jebusites that none of these lame or blind can eat at my table. And so people have taken that to mean like David was just, he was an ableist is what they would say today of somebody who's not wanting to have anybody with disabilities nearby. But we can see now in this passage, that was not David's intention. He was not saying that uh, all people with any kind of disability, uh, keep them out of my sight because here's Mephibosheth who can't walk. So what we need to go back and remember, he was saying like the, the Jebusites said the lime and blind would lime and blind, lame and blind, <laughs> lime and blind, the, 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 the lame and the blind would not be able to eat or would be able to defeat him. And so he was reversing their curse against the Jebusites in particular. And so, um, yeah, so he's bringing him in. And Ziba, who was a steward for Saul, you know, all of the properties of Saul are given back to Mephibosheth, but he can't care for them because he can't walk. And so Ziba, who was probably trying to like scrabble things together uh, to, as a family, I mean, he's got 15, uh, what was it? Ziba had... Um, 15 sons and 20 servants. He had a lot of household of his own. Um, where is that? Verse 10. Thank you. Um, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Yeah. So Ziba had a big family 
and a large group of people that he oversaw. Um, and so he's trying to keep them all together. And so now it's like, all right, you can care for Saul's estate and the beneficiary of all of these estates is going to be Mephibosheth. Um, and so this is a good arrangement. Um, and then also like you're, Mephibosheth, you're going to eat at my table. And he treats him like his own son, which is um, another level of elevation. But it's also uh, a, a kind of a deft political move because um, when we read later in, uh, in the time of the exile, the uh, king ba uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes King Jehoiakim. And he, it says in those passages, Jehoiakim ate at Nebuchadnezzar's table. And the reason that ancient kings would do this is because it's like, I want to keep an eye on you. So there is an elevation of, of Mephibosheth as, as David's motivation, but there's also like, hey, I'm going to keep you close because if I can keep you close, then I know what you're up to. And I know you're not going to try to turn against me because I'm, I'm, he's, I'm, David's giving Mephibosheth all of this stuff. And with all of this stuff, there is a risk that Mephibosheth could try to take back the kingdom um, because there is no reason a, a person who can't walk couldn't be king because they've already got a really nice chair, right? I mean, they're, like, they're in the throne. Uh, and so like, he, he can rule even if he can't work a field, um, if he could just gather enough people to be on his side. Now, hold that thought for several weeks from now. Remember that, because that will come back, <laughs> because things will happen in David's kingdom uh, where people will turn against him. And so, yeah, so it's, it, this is a nice, kind act uh, that David is doing uh, for Jonathan's son. Um, and uh, as we are continuing in, we're going to look at chapter 10, we're going to see uh, David and going into battle, his kingdom is going to fight against the Ammonites. Now, one of the nice things about like looking at large chunks of scripture, like we're doing, like tonight we're going over four chapters, is we are going to see some of the artistic brilliance of the writer of Second Samuel, because the story of David and Beth Bathsheba is well known. Um, but often people just jump in on chapter 11. But chapter 10 actually gives us the whole context for these events. Chapter 10 gives us a picture of what is going on. And at the end of chapter 12, we wrap up this battle with the Ammonites. But everything that's happening with David and Bathsheba is happening in this larger context of a, a battle that um, David has sent his people away on and he has stayed home. And so um, it's not just that David didn't want to go to war. And, you know, and some people say David was abdicating his responsibility, all these different things. We'll get to that. But um, there's a big context here that's going on. And so chapter 10 informs chapter 11 and gives it a little bit more depth. Um, so uh, let's jump to chapter, <clears throat> chapter 10. In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son, Hanun, succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanun concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite commanders said to Hanun, their lord, Do you think David is honoring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them? to you only to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it. So Hanun seized David's envoys, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments at the buttocks, and sent them away. When David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, stay at Jericho till your beards have grown, and then come back. So this... Uh, one of the, the challenges in the, uh, in, in the ancient world here with these kings is the, the sons of the kings 
tend to be pretty dumb. Um, and we see this in, uh, you know, Solomon, the wisest man in the world, but also an idiot, like just dumb. Uh, yeah, he led the, king, the kingdom into great sinfulness. And then the, his son, Rehoboam, listened to his advisors and divided the kingdom in half. And so there is a tendency with, with good kings in, in the Old Testament. We see good kings, their sons are dumb, often. Not every time, but often. And so this is one of those situations where David had a relationship with Nahash, and Nahash was supportive of him and helped him in, when, when he was uh, in a bad way with Saul. And so he hears about Nahash's death. And he's like, I will send my blessings. I will send my condolences. And I want to be kind, and, and I want to have a treaty with uh, with the kingdom of, uh, of the Ammonites. Um, so he, he does this, but Hanun listens to his advisors instead of trusting David as somebody who wants the best for their relationship between the David and, and the Israelites and the Ammonites. So they embarrass and humiliate the envoy. And the, the Old Testament law gave uh, instructions on how men should uh, keep their, their hair and their beards um, and so to shave off half of their beard was a, a humiliating thing for them. I mean, you know, three of us here have beards. And if somebody just shaved off half of our beards, like I would in our culture, it'd be like, you know, okay, I'll just shave off the other half. It'll all grow back. But, you know, for this culture to say, no, the beard is actually a part of my very person. And to cut that off is a uh, yeah it's a, a huge humiliation it also shows and i'm like but you, you don't trust the lord you don't you don't want to follow the ways of god in this culture by cutting off their beards then also like it says it cut off at the buttocks but it really is like cut off at the waist and so like it wasn't just their their butts were exposed it was like they cut off their robes at the waist so they they sent them back with basically just a shirt and so they go to jericho which is the first city across the Jordan River, because the Ammonites are on the east side of the Jordan River, and they go as that's really the first place they can stop and try to figure out what do we do? Because we're, we're not going to travel all the way home looking like this. And so David says, all right, wait there, and we will, uh, we will sort this out. But you don't need to carry more shame um, and go home you know, I mean, in Jericho, they could give them more clothes, but it's like your beard is still a mess. So uh, wait there until your beards grow back. And so it's chapter or verse six um, <clears throat> says this, uh, when the Ammonites realized they had become obnoxious to David, it's like, oh, we made a huge mistake. Uh, they hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beth or Hobe at Anzoba, as well as the king of Ma'aka with a thousand men and also 12,000 men from Tov. On hearing this, David sent Joab out with the, the entire army of fighting men. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance of the city gate, while the Arameans of Zobah and Rehob and the men of Tov and Ma'aka were by themselves in the open country. Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him. So he selected some of the best troops in Israel and deployed them against the Arameans. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. Joab said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come to rescue you. Be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. And so there going against the, the, the Ammonites to discover that it's not just the Ammonites. The Ammonites have this coalition of hired soldiers, and they are, there are two sets of battle lines now. So they're north and south, basically. The, the Ammonites are, and the Arameans are going to um, pinch them. So a pincer move type thing. So they're going to be able to come both ways. And so Joab has to make a decision. Do we just focus on one or the other? Or do we divide our forces? And the danger in dividing your forces is you have half the strength going in two different directions. Um, but he uh, 
decides to you know send his brother Abishai to go and fight uh, the the Ammonites, and he's going to fight the Arameans, um, which is a, a bold bold move. Uh, and Joab is able to motivate the people here with his short speech uh, and saying like, we're just keep an eye out for each other. If it, if you see that, if your people see that we're being over, overrun, come to our aid, we'll do the same for you. Um, but we're taking a risk, but let's fight for our God and for the cities of our God. Like this is, this is a, a, a rallying cry and the people respond uh respond well and so in verse 13 then joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the arameans and they fled before him when the ammonites realized that the arameans were fleeing they fled before abishai and went inside the city so joab returned from fighting the ammonites and came to jerusalem and so the, it was it was effective here to uh to fight and part of why it might have been effective is cuz the arameans are mercenaries they're hired soldiers and they're like oh we we really have no strong desire to fight you and so they might have gotten into the skirmish and be like i right, we're not this is where our heart's not in this we're out of here uh so they were able to then turn on the ammonites and defeat them after the arameans saw that they had been routed by israel they regrouped had a desert had arameans brought from behind the euphrates river they went to the helam and the shobak and commander of Hadadezer's army leading them. Uh, and so they, Arameans go back like, we don't have enough. Maybe we've got more. Let's get more. When David was told of this, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan and went to Helam. The Arameans formed their, their battle lines to meet David and fought against him. But they fled before Israel and David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also struck down Shobak, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings who were vassals of Hadadezer saw that they had been routed by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. So the Arameans were afraid to help the Am Ammonites anymore. So the in the, like here we have this victory that is setting up greater alliances for David in the region as he defeats the the Arameans who should have never been in this fight in the first place. Um, and, you know, coming down from the Euphrates River, trying to get all these other people to get involved and David defeats them all. And so this builds to an opportunity to, to build greater peace with the Arameans and their, their allies, because nobody wants to fight David and the Israelites anymore. And, uh, and so this is working out really well for David. This does not solve the Ammonite problem, though. I mean, the Ammonites are going to continue to be a force to be reckoned with. And this battle that's happening in chapter um, in chapter 10 that with the Amorites and the Arameans is the context that we find ourselves in chapter 11. Because the, uh, the victory that brought peace with much of the region didn't it led to pro, most likely a siege around Ammon and and one city in particular and and that's where we are in chapter 11 when it says in the springtime at the time when kings go off to war David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israel army they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah but David remained in Jerusalem so they they've won out in the field against the Ammonites and the Ammonites have retreated into Rabbah and so now they, Joab and the army of Israel is surrounding the city and laying siege to it. And a siege is, in the ancient world, is really just a waiting game. You, you surround the city so that they can't trade, they can't, uh, they can't farm. Uh, they really do run out of resources. And it's a way of saying, like, when you're ready to surrender, we're ready to accept your surrender. And, and so that's where Joab is. So David defeated the, the Amorites, the Arameans, uh, and he has gone back to Jerusalem, and Joab and the army is at, uh, at Rabbah. So that's what's happening here. It's not that David is irresponsible or um, not like all the other kings were not to war. David should have been at the battle lines too. 
that's not the case. David is David is doing what kings do. Often, uh, when we read about kings in the ancient world, uh, they are credited with all of the battle victories, but they are sending generals and representatives. They just get the credit because they are the king. And so, um, you know, even in our country right now, like we have so much, uh, like when legislation is passed, like the president signed this bill into law. Well, the president signed a thing and he gets credit for it, but it was also all of these other people writing the legislation, you know? And so it's not the, the president didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write this law. No, he's just affirming it. Um, and so David is uh, like a king, like all those victories, all those battles, he's getting all those, all that credit for that. Um, and it's okay that he's in Jerusalem. Being in Jerusalem is not the problem in this passage. All right. So um, let's keep going because he is building peace. He is building his, uh, his kingdom. They're just waiting out the Ammonites. And one evening, in, chapter, in verse 2, one evening, <clears throat> David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So one evening, David can't sleep, goes up, walks around the roof. And this was not an unusual thing to do. It was uh, the roof of most of the houses in this in the ancient world were flat, and there were places that you were supposed to you you could uh, get some cool breezes in the evening, because uh, yeah, it's, that's just one of the reasons why they built flat roofs. One of my favorite laws in all of the Old Testament is when you enter into the land, build a parapet around your roof so that your neighbor doesn't fall off, and thus you would be guilty of bloodshed. I love that law because it's saying like, hey. Guard your friends as you're hanging out, <laughs> like as you're up on the roof, like make sure that your friends don't fall off. Otherwise, you're guilty of manslaughter. It's such a, a common sense law. And it's one of the ways that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In our context, everyone, growing up, I would, I would read that. I'd be like, that doesn't make any sense. Who's hanging out on the roof? Because all our roofs are pitched, <laughs> right? Uh, and so like, we're not hanging out up there. But this was a, basically a place where you socialize. And so it's not unusual for him to be on the roof. It's also not unusual for Bathsheba to be on the roof. Because as we read here, she is purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And so anytime a woman uh, was menstruating, she would uh, be ceremonially unclean. Uh, and so part of the, the law was to have a degree of separation because blood of any sort is makes people unclean. And so she would be separated from the household to make sure that the house didn't become ceremonially unclean. And this is part of the law and everybody was cool with it. It was fine. And, and one of the ways they would accommodate is they would build tents on the roof. And, and so people would live on the roof basically. And it's a warmer climate. And so it, it is not a great hardship. But part of becoming uh, clean, clean again after being ceremonially unclean is bathing. And so they would have a way for, to bathe on the roof. All of these things, all of these things are totally normal. And totally, it wasn't like Bathsheba was out on the roof saying, I'm going to try to get David's attention. And it wasn't like David was just hanging out in, in Jerusalem saying, well, now that everybody's away, I'm going to see if I can get up to some trouble. But the trouble is he saw her and then inquired about her. Because temptation, being tempted is not a sin. It's that inquiring about the temptation. Who is that? And, you know, the story could have been to totally different. And David was like, oh, there's a naked woman over there. I'm going to go to this side of the roof. <laughs> I don't need to be over here, but 
he asks about her. And we are told that she's daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah the Hittite. And as we learn more about David's mighty men, later on in the book, we will see that Uriah and Eliam were both highly trusted people in David's army. These were some of his mighty men. And there, there, there's a reason why their houses are this close to the palace, because they are known by David. And that, so this is a, 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 a wife of somebody who he trusts with his life. And, and so this is not just a, a fling. This is a, this act, when he brings her to the palace and he sleeps with her, this is a great betrayal to a person that he trusts. And, and so sends her away and like, all right, probably thought she'd never do that again. But she sends word, I am pregnant. And we know that this is David's son, this child at this point. We don't know if it's a son. Uh, it will be a son, but right now we don't know. We know this is David's child because we know that she was purifying herself from her period. So she was not pregnant before. Uh, so when Uriah went away to war, like there was no way that he could have impregnated his wife. And so now David is in panic mode. Um, and so he makes a scheme. And this is so often the trouble that geek people get into is when they start scheming. In uh, verse 6. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from the military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on the mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. And so David brings Uriah home to say, basically, on the pretense of like, give me a report from the war. How, how are the front lines going? And then it's like, great, thank you. I, I don't really care about any of the report. Just go home and enjoy the company of your wife is what David is trying to do, because then he can have some deniability about his affair with Bathsheba. But Uriah refuses. And so the question is, why? Why does Uriah refuse? And the key for this is when it says, uh, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. For the ark of the covenant to be at the front lines, there is a level of ceremonial purity that is necessary to be a part of this war because it is now a holy war. So when David went to the, the tabernacle uh, and he got the bread from the priest and he got Goliath's sword, the question that the priest asked was, have your men stayed away from women? Have they slept with anyone? Why? Well, sleeping with somebody, even your wife, would make a 24-hour uh, a period of ceremonial uncleanness. And so Uriah is like, I'm just here for a little bit, giving you a report, and then I'm going to go back. And he's like, I don't want to disqualify myself from being able to serve in the Lord's army. 
And so Uriah is a man of honor and integrity. And so he's like, no, I'm just going to sleep at home in the, in the, in the streets, basically, rather than go home and face that, the possibility of becoming unclean. And so David is like, why aren't you more like me? Is, is how, like, how David must be feeling. Like, you have this opportunity. Go home. And so he's like, well, if you're not going to go home sober-minded, I'm going to get you good and drunk and send you home again. And Uriah is one of the few people who holds strongly to their integrity while drunk. And he still doesn't go home. So now David is in a, a, a real difficult situation because he, he, there's no way that he's going to convince Uriah to go home and sleep with Bathsheba. There's no way that he's going to be able to work out of this trap that he has made for himself. So he, his scheme continues, um, and he has another plan in place in verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in the front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jer Jerob Besheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants and the, from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messengers, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as the other. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So David, knowing that Uriah is not going to sleep with Bathsheba, uh, decides to remove Uriah from the equation. And he writes a letter to Joab, which is essentially Uriah's death warrant. And he sends Uriah to Joab with the letter saying, kill this guy. And Joab does what he's ordered. And the real tragedy here is like they're in a siege. There's no reason for them to come against Rabba so hard. And Joab is even writing this in, as like, you know, the king might freak out later. Like when he's telling the servant, go tell the king what happened. He might be really upset what happened. And he's going back and going back to a story in, in the book of Judges to say, this is what happened when uh, a woman dropped a millstone on this guy. Like, remember this story. And um, because they just needed to wait. They just needed to wait them out. But in a siege, there might be opportunity that somebody could see to say, hey, maybe if we go and attack that place, we might be able to draw them out and then make them weaker. So that's the rationale that Joab used. And they send some people. And we're told that some of David's men fell, men we don't have names for, they died, and Uriah died. David's goal was to kill Uriah, but he also had this collateral damage of other people's lives. This is the, this is the king abusing his power, first of all, with Bathsheba, then with his general, and then with the life of Joab and some men. He's abusing his power. He's just treating everybody like he owns them, and this is not good. And so it all comes to pass exactly as David 
hoped Uriah died. Um, and the messenger was like, don't worry about this. This is war. These things happen. It's so callous. And so just like, like Uriah was a man that you trusted. And you just like sent him out to die, carrying the letter. It's intense. It's like, this is, this is the stuff of high drama that like would make the life of David like a really great TV show or series or, um, but again, it would probably be rated TVMA because of the violence, but also the sexuality. So David uh, allows Bathsheba to mourn. And usually it's about a month and then he marries her. And to the world at large, they would have said, oh, this was the widow of a man that David trusted and he wants to make sure that she's cared for. So he's bringing her in to his, his, his family and he's, he's marrying her and making sure that she's okay. It would have looked so good and, and kind to so many people. But David knows the real reason I'm marrying Bathsheba is because she's pregnant with my child. And the Lord knows because it says, the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So all of this is happening while they are, there's this battle in Am Ammon happening. And we met a few weeks ago, a prophet named Nathan. And this is the second time we interact with Nathan uh, in chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. He had bought, he raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord says. The God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you, I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord, by doing what is evil in his eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan, last time we saw him, we meet him as a kind of a yes man. The Lord is with you. Do whatever you please. And then, the, the Lord sends Nathan, the prophet, to correct him strongly. In the past, the Lord spoke to Nathan, telling him, you know, David's not going to be the one to build the temple. His son is going to build the temple. I'm going to establish a house and, and a dynasty for David. And, and so he comes with a, a correction, but also a great promise. And so Nathan is welcome in the king's court. <laughs> but Nathan knows the message that the Lord is sending to uh, to David through the prophet. And so tells a story because stories have a way of disarming us. And parables like this get you invested in the characters and you can see like, oh, this is a great injustice. And there's a reason why Jesus told so many parables and so many stories is because people grip on to the story and they're like, oh yeah, okay, there's a truth here. 
And you see David's anger, like this man must die and pay back four times, which was the, the requirement in the law. Later on in, in Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus, when he is, uh, encounters Jesus and he, he gets up and he says, I will pay back, I will give half of everything I own to the poor and I will pay back four times if I have cheated anybody. Like that's all part of the law. And so like this is, and I, I was thinking about that because I was writing a message with that passage today. I was like, oh, look at this four times, four times. It's all consistent. The law is beautiful. Um, and so David is like, these are the things that must happen to this man. What a terrible, terrible person. He's incensed at a lamb. But Nathan then has to, with all the boldness that God can muster in a person, point at the king and say, talking about you, you did this. Um, and that, that sentence, you are the man. The man that I'm talking about, that's you. That is a difficult thing for any person to do to confront a person of power like this. But this is part of the job of the prophet. The prophet is not intended to be a yes man for the people in power. It, throughout the Old Testament, you, and you know, it, even more so as we move out of the, the life of David um, and even Solomon, after Solomon's death, we start to see the prophets start to rise up and the prophets really do confront the kings over and over again to challenge their behavior. And so this is really the first um, with this long teaching and like with an immediate consequence that we're gonna start seeing, but also a long-term consequence in the life of David. Um, and so he says, you're the one, you did this, God knows you did this. And now everything, everything you did try to do in secret, God's gonna bring it out into the light. And, and so the things that are happening to, to David in, that are promised here, like they're all going to happen. His son, uh, Ab Absalom, is going to try to take the kingdom from David. And he's going to take David's wives and concubines. And he's going to sleep with them up on the roof. He's going to do all of this in broad daylight. And, and David is recognizing, like, oh, man, I am found out. And this is where we see his his heart compared to David's, I, or compared to Saul, I have sinned against the Lord. And David, in just a few paragraphs earlier, said, the man who took this lamb and, and, and killed it and fed it to the guest, he should die. And so David is recognizing, like, my life is now in danger. Like, if I'm this incensed about the sheep, like, then, man, I... I got nothing. I have no right to stand on. But this is where we will see the, the grace and the mercy of God in this passage in verse uh, 13b. Uh, Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. So now, no, the Lord has taken away your sin. There's no sacrifice offered. There's nothing that David did here to have his sin taken away. But also, the Lord did not take away the consequence of his sin. So this is something that when we think about forgiveness, like the Lord forgave my sins. Yeah, that's great, awesome. God is good and he's gracious, but sin breaks everything and it, it leads to consequences. And so all these consequences that, that Nathan is gonna say, you uh, has said and will say, like this is all part of what happened because of David's action. But the Lord still loves David, loves him enough to say, I'm not going to bring the death that you deserve on you right now. So there's mercy here. Um, it says, you are not going to die, but because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. So Bathsheba's son will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat 
and he food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us. When we spoke to him, how can we, know, how can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked? Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on his lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food, and he ate. His attendants asked, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But then now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So, yeah, it's so sad. Like this section is so heartbreaking just because the child is like not even named in this passage. And one of the details here is the child died on the seventh day. And on the seventh day, you know, like that's a seventh day is a, a, you know, a week completion. Seventh day is the Sabbath. There's all kinds of things with the seven. But for an infant boy, the eighth day is what really matters. Because the eighth day is the day that the child is circumcised. And most likely the child, the day the child is given a name. And so this child, we don't even get a name because he never even got to the eighth day. And David, you know, is fasting and praying and, and he's doing this mourning, knowing like that what God has said, but hoping that God would relent. Um, and when the baby dies and David gets like, well, seems like he's so callous like well that's that uh, and the, the servants are like what is going on here like we don't understand your behavior but you know he says i was hoping that god would change his mind that he would relent but he also recognizes like my mourning my grief right now can't bring him back but david recognizes his own mortality i will go to him he will not come to me David, like he's saying, is like, when I die, I will go be with that child. And in the ancient Hebrew world, there was um, the understanding of, of the afterlife. There's Sheol, the, the realm of the dead. Um, and righteous and unrighteous, they all went to Sheol. And there was, when we fast forward to uh, when Jesus talks about the Lazarus and the rich man in that parable, we see a world of Abraham's bosom and the a, a world of torment. So there's a, a place of comfort and a place of torment in the world of the dead in Sheol. And so David is probably in some area, like in the spectrum of understanding the afterlife is like, this is what he's picturing. So when I die, I will go and be with him. So far, when people die, they're gathered to their ancestors. But this is one of the times where we see David is actually going to be gathered to a descendant, which is a, a, a tragic story in its own right. You know, anytime a parent has to bury a child of whatever age, it's hard. This last Saturday, I was at a memorial service uh, for a 30-year-old man who, uh, he was in my youth group, uh, the first church I worked at, and, you know, he, he died and his parents were there grieving and talking about stories about about chris and all this stuff it was such a tragedy and this is a 30 year old person like it was, it was awful it was hard and so here we have you know a, an infant who is it, the infant didn't do anything and this is one of the heartbreaking things and like when i re read passages like this i'm like why lord why and i do not have any good answers and there are things in the Bible that we read where 
we can say like, I don't have a good answer for this. But other than sin breaks everything. And there are consequences to sin that go beyond me and it affects others. And so I know that child is in a realm of comfort of some sort. And David is with this child. Um, but the story continues. Verse 24, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedidiah. So after a period of time, David and Bathsheba, they're married. And so they, uh, they sleep together and another son is born. And Bathsheba has four sons with David total. Um, and when we look at the, the list of sons in uh, Chronicles, there's Solomon is actually listed last. And so there may be other sons between now and between this child that died and Solomon. We don't totally know, but the Lord loved Solomon. Um, and that would, if Solomon is the youngest in the line of Bathsheba's sons, that would be consistent with the Lord consist, constantly choosing the younger to lead the older. And so that would not, that should not surprise us when we read that in Chronicles to be like, oh, there's this younger son is now going to be the king, but it is a, a, a theme throughout the Old Testament that God does that. Um, but there's a compressed time that the writer of 2 Samuel may be using to say like, they were married, they had a life. Eventually they had this son, they named Solomon. And Solomon uh, means uh, Yahweh's restoration or peace. And so they saw him as like, the Lord is restoring. The Lord is bringing peace into our, our family. Um, Jedediah uh, means the Lord loved. And so the Lord loves this child. And so when Nathan goes and says, his name is actually Jedediah. Nowhere else does he ever get called Jedediah. Uh, and so, um, yeah, but it is one of those things like, no, this is, the, this is the name God wants to give this kid is Jedediah. Um, so there's some restoration happening there. One more section to read tonight. Meanwhile, Joab fought against Rabbah. <laughs> He's still out there at Rabbah uh, of the Ammonites and captured the royal city, Citadel. Joab then sent messengers to David saying, I have fought against Rabbah and taken his water supply. Now muster the rest of the troops and besiege the city and capture it. Otherwise, I will take the city and it will be named after me. So David mustered the entire army and went to Rabbah and attacked and captured it. David took the crown from the king's head and it was placed on his own head. It weighed a talent of gold and it was set with precious stones. David took a great quantity of plunder from the city and brought out the people who were there, consigning them to labor with saws, with iron picks and axes, and he made them work at brick making. David did this to all the Ammonite towns. Then he and his army returned to Jerusalem. So 11 through 13, or through 12, like that's, or 10 through 12, that's all one big chapter in David's life, bookended by these battles. And when the the king was no longer necessary to besiege the city. He's home, um, and that's fine. But now, Joab, who really didn't ask any questions, like, why do you want Uriah dead? He's, he's doing, Joab's just doing a good job out here, doing whatever the king says. And he's like, finally, at the point where it's like, all right, we captured the city. The siege is almost over. The wa they don't have any more water. Like, now's the time. Come and come to the front lines so that you, David, can get the credit, or else I'm going to take it. <laughs> which is a pretty gutsy move for Joab. But it might be that Joab was like, I'm tired of just being your errand boy here and having people killed that I, I didn't ask any questions, but I'm tired of it. So get out here and do something. Um, and so David does, they win. And David takes this huge, huge uh, crown. It says it's a talent of gold, which is about 75 pounds. So most likely they weren't wearing this crown. It says it put it on his head, but it's more like just like, it probably just was like, this is mine. It's for my head. I'm not going to walk around with it because 75 pounds on your head would uh, probably break your neck. So, um, yeah, so he wins. 
They defeat the Ammonites, these, the, and the Ammonites have been enemies of the people of Israel for so long, and David defeated them. So in the midst of these victories, there's also this personal tragedy that David brought upon himself. Um, and so, yeah, so I, you know, reading through a large section like this is important to see, but we are going to start seeing David's life to start to decline. Uh, and his reign is going to start to decline. Chapter 13 jumps right into Amnon and Tamar and uh, the tragedy that is Amnon raping Tamar and then Absalom killing Amnon. I'm just spoiling it for y'all if you haven't read this stuff. Um, killing uh, Amnon and then Absalom being exiled and then Joab bringing him back. And then it's a, just a whole mess as uh, David doesn't deal with the problem directly. Like there's some things that if David would have just dealt with it, maybe things would have been different here. But again, he didn't deal with it. He just let it go. And so, um, yeah, so that's where we'll stop. And next week we'll uh, read, I'm hoping to get through uh, part of 16. Um, so if, if you want to read ahead, 13 through 16, 14 is kind of a breakdown that I have. Um, so yeah, but any questions tonight on all that we read? Whether you're in online, you're in the room, any questions? No? All right. Well, Carrie? Oh, sorry. My button won't be on the first. Okay, it's okay. No, I'm, I just, it always astounds me because, you know, it says, um, David was a man after God's own heart, yet look at all the drama in his life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, being a man after God's own heart does not mean you won't have drama. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe because... that's the other reversal because it seems like the closer you get to God, the more the enemy tries to attack you. Um, yeah. But part of this story, though, is noticeably absent is the devil. Yeah. Like, we don't need to blame the devil for our own sin. You know, that, True, right? <laughs> that that picked that cartoon like the devil made me do it it's like no you did it and no. so and i think that might be part of why david is different than saul is like i have sinned against the lord when saul messed up he said i was afraid of the people the yeah. people made me do it and david is saying no i did this this was and my he fault he took responsibility yeah so when we talk about salvation and repentance like i can't repent for other people's sins i can only repent for mine and so when we look at like systemic problems like are there systemic problems in the world yes absolutely there are major corruption things all over the place all the time i can't i can't repent for systemic problems in the world i can just say am i contributing to this am i a part of the problem or am i Am I living in a way where I'm trying to seek God's justice and live righteously? I, and that's all we can really do. And if, if enough people were to say, I want to live righteously and, and follow God's commands, and like that brings transformation to the systems and society, hopefully, but there's still going to be people, and people are a mess. So if anything we've re read from the Bible, we should know people are a mess. <laughs> that's been the theme over and over again so yeah yeah any other questions or observations or thoughts no i don't know you see a touching side of him too when he takes him that one i can't say the name mephibosheth mephibosheth yeah, yeah. a very tender side of him he didn't have to do that yeah, and that's one of the last kindnesses that we're going to read in David's life is Mephibosheth. Yeah. Um, didn't have to, other than the oath to Jonathan. But if Jonathan's dead, Jonathan's not going to try to enforce that oath. Right? Yeah. But David was a man of honor here with his best friend to say, like, no, I'm going to do this because I promised Jonathan, even though he's long dead. Um, yeah. 
Mephibosheth. Yeah, that's a, uh, that story will come back. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll see him again. Um, so it's going to be a fun time. People are a mess. That's all I, that's all I can say sometimes when I read the Bible and just shake your head. Go, ah, why are we this way? So, um, yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap there and, uh, we will uh, come back next week and we'll talk, we'll continue the life of David. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word and these challenging passages and these heartbreaking stories. Lord, we thank you that, that you saw to inspire the writers of scripture to tell the truth, even when the truth was embarrassing to your king, to your kingdom, you still wanted your people to know. And so I pray that you would help us to walk in humility, walk in grace, and to recognize the call to repentance from sin, to live justly, and to seek your righteousness. So help us to, to do that um, and to learn from the example that we see in Scripture of what to do and also what not to do. So help us, Lord. Amen.